when I was a student at Scarsdale High School, I enrolled in a film studies course, and yes, we do have those. For our final assessment, we were tasked with writing a paper featuring our analysis on one of the five film options the teacher selected. To my film buff father's delight, I chose to examine John Huston's The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And I'm just gonna take some data points here. Who here even knows that movie? Okay, okay, we've got a few. In this classic, two impoverished American protagonists stranded in Mexico, Fred Dobbs and Bob Curtin, convince Howard, an experienced prospector, to help them mine for gold in the Sierra Madre Mountains. During their adventures, Dobbs becomes overtaken by greed and paranoia and dies chasing his dream of becoming rich. Dobbs meets his untimely end after he attempts to kill his partner, Curtin, and steals the gold they accumulated over months of back-breaking work. The prospectors hid their riches in burlap bags under animal skins tied to a team of mules. After shooting Curtin and leaving him for dead, Dobbs leads the mule team from the wilds of the bush to civilization where he can then sell the gold. Dobbs is beset by a group of bandits who steal the mules and the animal skins and discard the gold, mistaking it for bags of sand used to enhance the weight of skins. Although Curtin survives, his dreams of wealth evaporate as the gusty winds blow the gold from torn sacks back to the mountain from which it came. Despite this ironic turn of events, Curtin finds contentment in his lot. Though he lost his material wealth, he survived and ultimately maintained his self-worth because the gold and the opportunity to become rich never defined him. In this week's Parshat Shoftim, we are given a key to a similar story, one that also underscores the value of elevating humility and contentment over the snares of greed and arrogance. This key is the word tamim in the following verse. Tamim tehyeh imadonai elohecha. In this context, tamim is most often translated as, you shall be wholehearted with your God. Though the root tav mem mem from the word tamim can convey wholeheartedness, completeness, perfection, it can also express simplicity, even foolishness. Consider, for instance, the four children in the Passover Haggadah. Chacham, the wise one. Resha, the wicked one. Tam, the simple one, She'eno yodea lish'o, the one who doesn't even know what to ask. This tricky term, tam, leads us to a famous tale written by the Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, called the Hacham and the Tam, or in English, the Sophisticate and the Simpleton. In this narrative, Rabbi Nachman highlights the spiritual and internal wealth that lies in being the tum, the so-called fool. Not foolish as in greedy like Dobbs, but rather like Curtin, one who is satisfied with simply surviving rather than getting carried away with the glaring prospect of gaining affluence. Rabbi Nachman's story opens by introducing two young men the sophisticate and the simpleton, who grew up in the same town as close friends. The sophisticate had great intellect. The simpleton had a more straightforward, humble approach to life. When the boys were tasked with searching for employment, they embarked on different routes. The simpleton learned the trade of a shoemaker a so-called lowly profession because the worker is in constant contact with filth. The sophisticate, on the other hand, felt he was capable of doing more skillful work, so he pursued an opportunity to assist merchants. But when the sophisticate and the merchants reached their final destination in Warsaw, he wondered to himself, 
Why should I be bound to them? Maybe there's some better place. So he became a shopkeeper. When the sophisticate recognized the work of a shopkeeper was difficult, he decided he wanted a more relaxed position, which would allow him to travel. After he explored the world, learning new languages and experiencing new cultures, he figured, it's time to set a goal for myself. So he became a goldsmith. This occupation required great intellect and offered him a generous salary. Though he gained a valuable skill, I'm sure you can guess what happens next, the sophisticate concluded it was not enough. Perhaps another expertise would be even more prestigious. He later moved on to become a gem cutter, then a physician, then a philosopher, and all along the way, he was miserable. No one was ever smart enough for him to converse with. No one could meet his arrogant expectations. And simultaneously, he himself was never good enough, always attempting to do more, to do better. The simpleton, however, lived with a vastly different mindset. No matter what he did or what he had, he felt joy. As a shoemaker, he had to study and work constantly to become an expert at this craft, though he never even became an elite artisan. He barely had a spare minute to eat, spending little time with his wife, and yet he found gratitude for all of it. With his limited income, he and his wife could only eat slices of bread. But each time he took a bite, he envisioned a different gourmet meal saying, mmm, how nice and delicious this soup is. Though he only drank water, he would holler, now that's some tasty wine. Though he only had one sheepskin to wear, he would praise his wife for adorning him in plush fur coats. The simpleton appreciated what he already had. He had the confidence to value his own worth to cherish the one skill he acquired and the wisdom outweighing intelligence to make the most of his lot rather than endlessly searching for more. At the close of Rabbi Nachman's tale, the simpleton's humility is rewarded, leading him to become prime minister of Poland, whereas the sophisticate's arrogance brings him nothing but self-inflicted anguish. Through this story, Rabbi Nachman teaches that the simpleton has been able to mine great wealth from ordinary stone akin to fool's gold. One steeped in arrogance might believe fool's gold pales in comparison to real gold. However, one endowed with humility can recognize the specks of gold that shine brighter laced throughout this amalgam. It's small pockets of riches like I said, brighter than mounds of refined metal. So if we replace the translation of wholeheartedness for Tamim in this week's Parsha with the lessons divined from the treasure of the Sierra Madre and from Rabbi Nachman, we reveal new interpretations for this verse. It no longer hearkens to the obvious message of restraining from idol worship, following God's commandments, but it implores us even further. It demands, be humble with your God, as in be open to learn, to appreciate that we don't know everything, to see the gifts and what we already have, to define ourselves not by our material possessions, but simply by our opportunity to exist. This alternative reading is so crucial, especially as we find ourselves in the second week of Elul the time in which we perform an accounting of our souls. These two stories teach us not to look for an illusory cachet of gold and opulence, but to embrace the solidity of a different rock. Adonai Tsuri, our rock and our redeemer, a bastion that can remind us to live humbly as we submit to this month of self-reflection. In closing, I offer this postscript. In a memorable scene from our TCM classic Midrash, one of the bandits masquerading as a federale disclosed his true identity by exclaiming, 
We don't need no stinking badges. Just like that, that accent. So let us eschew the temptations of false grandeur and follow the examples of Curtin and the simpleton by displaying our humility as badges of honor. Shabbat shalom.